This is Matthew Cratters, Bitcoin University. Today I want to talk about how Bitcoin culture has always been anti-spam. And we're going to be talking about this wonderful article from BitMEX Research published in July of 2022 called The Op Return Wars of 2024. Short history of Bitcoin wars might include the Op Return Wars of 2014, the Block Size Wars of 2015 to 2017, and then the Spam Wars, which really started in 2023 and are continuing today in 2025. The original Op Return Wars were fought over the question of the place of non-monetary data in Bitcoin. And in so many ways, the spam wars of today are really just a continuation of it. And that's why I wanted to make this video to provide some historical context for the current debate. And that context is this. The Bitcoin community has always been in favor of strictly limiting the amount of non-monetary data on Bitcoin. Bitcoin culture has always been anti-spam. It's always the shipcoiners who are pro-spam, and they're always trying to infect Bitcoin culture. And unfortunately, in 2025, even Bitcoin core devs have forgotten their cultural roots and how they used to help fight spam on Bitcoin. While at the same time, we're seeing a massive influx of Ethereum refugees coming from their failed coin and bringing their garbage culture with them to Bitcoin. As Dax Skywalker points out here, just remember when ship coins die, their developers and user base migrate to Bitcoin, not because they suddenly understand sound money, but because they're broke AF and need to find their next scam. Typical Ethereum person here. This BitMEX article attempts to answer the question, why did so much non-monetary garbage migrate to Ethereum and other chains rather than remaining on Bitcoin where it originated? Now, obviously, Ethereum has more developed complex smart contract capability with the attended downside of a much wider attack service, but it does have more complex smart contracts than Bitcoin, which may be part of the answer why we saw this migration of garbage from Ethereum, I'm sorry, from Bitcoin to Ethereum. But the authors of this paper, this BitMEX paper, conclude that it was mainly Bitcoin or cultural hostility to non-monetary data that led the spammers to leave Bitcoin for Ethereum, where they found a much more receptive home. The quote from the BitMEX paper is this, the most significant factor is culture. Some Bitcoiners and Bitcoin developers simply did not want this type of activity on the Bitcoin blockchain, and they successfully discouraged it. This seems to have primarily occurred in, in and around March of 2014. And my contention would be that we are still able to discourage these sort of developments on the Bitcoin blockchain if we want to have courage. If you're finding this video interesting so far, I just ask you to help to support this channel's educational mission really briefly here. Hit the subscribe button. That does really help. Leave a like, leave a comment, question, suggestion for a future video. Share this video with a friend or family member. Hit the join button and or leave a tip. Here's the short version of the war that played out. Some developers from outside of the Bitcoin community came up with a protocol that would allow them to issue ship coins on Bitcoin, which sounds a lot like inscriptions and BRC20 tokens in 2023, and this was called the Counterparty Protocol. This protocol abused the Bitcoin op code op check multisig to include counterparty data on the Bitcoin blockchain. It was and is considered abuse of the blockchain because this was clearly not an intended use of this op code which was instead designed as part of Bitcoin's multisig functionality, as you can tell from the name, OpCheck Multisig. Here's what one of the main Bitcoin core devs said at the time, quote, Check Multisig is quite clearly intended for ECDSA public keys, not arbitrary data. It should be no surprise that using an operation for something other than its intended purpose has negative, perhaps unintended or unknown consequences. Counterparty transactions are not, according to the Bitcoin protocol, they slip through because it never expected that the feature be used in that way. Side note, this same critique could be applied to inscriptions, which abuse the SegWit and Taproot upgrades in ways that we were never in, that were never intended when we did those upgrades. And also the same developer says it's called a free ride, referring to putting the spam on the blockchain. Given that the overwhelming majority, greater than 90%, application for the Bitcoin blockchain is currency use, i.e. monetary use, Using full nodes as dumb data storage terminals is simply abusing an all-volunteer network resource. The network replicates transaction data, so why not come along for a free ride? Rather than engage the existing community, MasterCoin and Counterparty simply flipped an on switch and started using Bitcoin P2P nodes as unwanted data stores. Notice that unlike the Bitcoin core devs of 2025, this Bitcoin core dev is not arguing that anyone who pays a transaction fee has the right to abuse node runners and make them relay spam or store their spam forever. Instead, he's arguing that spammers need to be fought because Bitcoin is a monetary network, not an arbitrary data cloud storage network. Now, Bitcoin core devs back in 2014 then suggested that counterparties should use the op return space instead. 
Counterparty devs responded that there was not enough space and op return for what they wanted to do. Now, if this were 2025 Bitcoin Core devs, they would have immediately rolled over and asked the spammers how they could better accommodate them. Quote, if we blow open op return, will that make it easier for you to spam? Instead, in 2024, we had a Bitcoin Core that sought to do anything it could to stop the spammers. And one of those Bitcoin Core devs was Luke Dasher, who's still around today, obviously. So enter the 2014 Luke Dasher, who made the following points. This is a quote. Too many people were getting the impression that op return was a feature meant to be used. It was never intended as such, only as a way to, quote, leave the windows unlocked so we don't need to replace the glass when someone breaks in, end quote. That is to to reduce the damage caused by people abusing Bitcoin. And then Luke went on to say, quote, 40 bytes is more than sufficient. 40 bytes of op return is more than sufficient for all legitimate needs for tying data to a transaction. You get 32 bytes for a hash plus eight bytes for some kind of unique identifier, which really isn't necessary either. In other words, spammers be gone. You get 40 bytes of op return, and that's more than enough for legitimate uses like time stamping. And I want to demonstrate that, that here using a SHA-256 calculator where you basically SHA-256 is a hash algorithm where you put in an input value and the output is always 32 bytes. So what I did here is I took the entire declaration of independence, which is obviously quite long. I put it through the hash and it comes up with a unique hash that is unlike anything else. If I change just one of these letters in the input, it will completely change the output. So this is a 32-bit hash. If the Bitcoin blockchain existed in 1776, the founders could have embedded a hash in the op return, a 32-byte hash, rather than unnecessarily burdening node runners with the entire Declaration of Independence, they could just put a hash, they could do it in July of 1776 or whatever, and that would be a timestamp of this document. So that's the correct way to use op return, and that w that's what Luke is arguing back in 2014 and also in 2025 as well. And other Bitcoin Core devs were happy to make this official as well. Before 2014, op return transactions were not relayed by nodes running Bitcoin Core. They could still be mined and included in a block, these op return transactions, but they were not relayed by nodes on the network. In the midst of these op return wars, Bitcoin Core was prepared to make a concession. They said, we're going to allow nodes to relay op return transactions as long as they're not larger than 40 bytes. And I should mention here that that's one reason that the default setting on Bitcoin knots, which is actually actually older than Bitcoin Core, Bitcoin Knots is 40 bytes because that's the historical setting for op return. And as we're going to see, Bitcoin Core later raised it to 80 bytes. So Bitcoin Core back in 2014 said we're going to allow nodes to relay op return transactions as long as they're not larger than 40 bytes. But that's it. Spammers who want to include more arbitrary data will not be tolerated. So here are the release notes from Bitcoin Core back in 2014. I think this is very interesting. March 19th, of 2024, Bitcoin Core version 0.9.0 released. And one of the interesting things about this, this was when they made Bitcoin Core official and they rebranded to it, rebranding to Bitcoin Core. To reduce confusion between Bitcoin the network and Bitcoin the software, we've renamed the reference client to Bitcoin Core. So it's quite ironic given recent developments in 2025 that this was the release where they took on the name Bitcoin Core. But here's the important thing I want to emphasize here. Op return and data in the blockchain. On op return, there's been some confusion and misunderstanding in the community regarding the op return feature in 0 0.9 and data in the blockchain. This change is not is not an endorsement of storing data on the blockchain. The op return change creates a provably printable output to avoid data storage schemes, some of which were already deployed that were storing arbitrary data such as images as forever unspendable transaction outputs bloating Bitcoin's UTXO database. And here's where Bitcoin Core emphasizes, storing arbitrary data in the Bitcoin blockchain is still a bad idea. It is less costly and far, far more efficient to store non-currency data elsewhere, not on the Bitcoin blockchain. And here's another quote from this article that talks about the history of the size of op return. Bitcoin Core 0.9.0 would only relay transactions with an op return of 40 bytes or less. If the data was larger than this, it was still a valid transaction. In other words, it followed consensus rules, but it would not be relayed. The limit was originally intended to be 80 bytes. However, after much discussion, the developers settled on 40 bytes, which is where Bitcoin Knots is still today. To be clear, the op return relay limit in a release version of Bitcoin Core never declined. 
In February 2015, Bitcoin Core 0 0.11.0 finally increased the relay limit to 80 bytes, which is where it is today. In January 2016, in Bitcoin Core 0 0.12.0, the limit was increased again to 83 bytes, the limit we have today. Although this three byte increase was merely a change in how the counting worked to include the opcodes themselves, so it is not a real increase. This, that, this means that if one wants a transaction with an op return output of over 80 bytes today in 2025, one has to mine it themselves or send it directly to a miner. And that's another way of saying that the op return filter has worked really, really well. So well, in fact, that you need to go straight to a miner to get a larger op return included in a block since nodes refuse to relay these transactions across the network. Filters work and the op return filter worked quite well from 2014 to 2025. So, so in summary, the op return of 40 or 80 bytes, whichever one, was given as a concession by Bitcoiners and Bitcoin Core to give people a place to store very small amounts of data. At the time of its release, Bitcoin Core went out of its way to state that storing mon non-monetary data, that storing non-monetary data on the Bitcoin blockchain was a terrible idea. Now contrast this with 2025 when Bitcoin Core has been corrupted either by ideology or possibly even by financial considerations and wants to go out of its way to completely open up the Bitcoin blockchain to people who want to fill it with spam. After two years of gaslighting us that filters don't work, Bitcoin Core wants to blow open a filter that itself, that it itself instituted in 2014 precisely to prevent op returns greater than 40 or 80 bytes from being relayed by nodes on the network. So when Bitcoin Core devs try to hit you with intricate technical arguments about how filtering can cause increased mining pool centralization, hint, it's already highly centralized, and it's only ocean mining, the same guys who are fighting spam, that is doing anything about it, or that filtering can cause worse transaction fee estimation, Hint, fee estimation is always a crapshoot because no one knows when the next block is going to be found anyway. When they try to hit you with these and other technical considerations, they are completely refusing to address how the culture of Bitcoin Core has changed from 2014 to 2025, from being non-monetary data fighters to becoming non-monetary data lovers. And today in 2025, Bitcoin Core wants to blow open this historical op return filter to allow an op return output to store unlimited data capped only by block size. And possibly, I'm not sure about this technical point, possibly a script pub key limit of 10,000 bytes. There may be some other limits there, but these we're talking much, much larger numbers than 40 or 80 bytes. So this is the point of this video to point out and to record that this is a stunning change in culture on the part of Bitcoin Core. And the plebs are rightly outraged by this, which is why so many of us are switching to Bitcoin knots. And we can see the Bitcoin knots nodes just going, going vertical here. Bitcoin Core is now below 90% approximately for the first time in history. If you want to learn how to run your own Bitcoin knots, uh, Bitcoin knots node, I'll link to these three videos. The first one I did, how to run your own Bitcoin node using knots, one from BTC Sessions, how to run knots on desktop on Brawl and Start9, and another one from Cole at Southern Bitcoin, trying to uh, teaching you how to run Bitcoin knots on Start9 and switch from Bitcoin Core to Bitcoin knots. So this question we keep coming back to on this channel, has Bitcoin Core gone rogue? Perhaps at minimum, as you've learned from this video, Bitcoin Core in 2025 has made a radical departure from its traditional roots in Bitcoin culture with its historical antipathy towards non-monetary data in the chain. From 2023 to 2025, Bitcoin Core refused to fix, to fix the filters. They refused to fix the filters to help discourage inscriptions and other spam. And now today in 2025, they want to blow open the op return filter and take away configurability from the user. They claim that they're worried about UTXO bloat, but from 2023 to the present, they sat on the sidelines and allowed inscriptions to bloat the UTXO set from 4 gigs to 12 gigs, while gaslighting everyone that these inscriptions could not be stopped and that filters don't work. And yet in 2025, they want to blow out the op return filter. This is the hypocrisy. Now, it's important to recognize here that spam is always a cat and mouse game that needs to be played, and it's an endless game. The difference is that in, 2020, in 2014, Bitcoin Core was willing to play this game, while in 2025, Bitcoin Core is for some reason unwilling to play this game. What changed? Have they been corrupted? Is there a better explanation that someone can offer me? If you enjoyed this video, be sure to hit the subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.